Hello, everyone, and I'd like to welcome you today to the Progressing and Planning um, event on um, data and open data and how that impacts on planning. Um, my name is Dr. Nancy Holman, and I'm going to be chairing today. Um, and we have a number of really exciting and interesting guests with us. Um, so I will kind of introduce them, then we'll go ahead into the presentations. And after the presentations, we'll have time for a Q&A so you can actually upload um, your questions there. Um, we have today with us Ima Mwanja, who is um, from the OpenStreetMap team in Tanzania. Um, and has been part of the Romani Huria project on flooding and resilience in Dar es Salaam, which I know a little bit about, it's really exciting. We have Dr. Mark Napier from the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research, and he's been um, part of the creation team of the Urban Knowledge Exchange in Southern Africa. And this is a knowledge sharing platform and networking platform that's designed to um, kind of provide evidence-based information um, about the built environment and human settlements and planning. And it's designed to help civil society and governments project on vulnerability um, to cope. Um, and he's going to be talking to us today also about a project on COVID and climate change. Um, and we will have the details on everyone's organizations in terms of websites um, available for you. I'd really highly recommend you check these out. And we also have Manon Vu, um, who is um, part of the CART ONG project. It's an NGO dedicated to um, putting geographical data and support um, out there for communities um, who are doing the production of humanitarian and development projects and social action projects. And she's gonna speak today on a open mapping project that they did in Burkina Faso. So I don't wanna take up too much time. Um, I'm going to open up the floor to our presenters and I believe we are starting with Ima. So I will let you go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much, Nancy. I'm going to share my screen right now. And in this, in this first session, we're going to uh, co-present Manon and I. Um, so I'm going to start with, uh, humanitarian Open Street Map team and Carter and G are part of, let's say, the Missing Map project, whereby the Missing Map project is, sorry, this is a lot of words, uh, but it is a project that is um, formulated by different NGOs or organizations that are meant to prepare or provide open data to first responders. And this open data is found in Open Street Map, and Manon is going to speak more about this uh, soon, whereby OpenStreetMap is a collaborative open data mapping project whereby anyone around the world can add to this to this map. And Humanitarian OpenStreetMap team is an international organization that is dedicated to humanitarian mapping and community development um, through mapping. And so um, the missing map projects is not formulated by just uh, HOT and CartoNG. There are like 18 other different organizations that form uh, this project. Uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> Hello, everyone. So just uh, in a short word, uh, Carto NG is a, is a support NGO based in France and uh, specialized in information management and especially geographical information for humanitarian and development projects. And these sectors also face a limited uh, data availability challenge. And to, tell, to tackle it, uh, Carto NG convinced that the open source and sharing data uh, is the best approach. And that's why we joined the, the Missing Maps project and promote OSM and contribute to it as a sustainable, collaborative and inclusive information management solution. And uh, maybe on the next one, I will go a bit further on the presentation of OpenStreetMap, the Wikipedia of maps. Uh, OSM, uh, the OpenStreetMap is OSM, it's, it's the uh, open and free map of the world. And uh, as Ima said, everyone can contribute. Uh, this means that you can use the data, extract it and use it for your own purpose. And you can also contribute to the map, create uh, data that you, you need and make other benefit from it also. Uh, today, OSM is uh, very complete and sometimes even more complete uh, than the proprietary map like uh, Google map. 
uh, in a lot of regions and especially in the global south. Um, it is a trusted, trusted tool for many professionals uh, of the humanitarian sector, but more widely uh, in different sectors uh, for researchers, for instance. But and it's true that it's less known for uh, by urban planner, and it's also why we wanted to focus a bit on this tool because it's a, I think it's a fantastic uh, uh, opportunity, and uh, I think we will have the opportunity pr to present how we we use it and uh, Ima and I on the uh, case study. So I let you Ima finish with the <laughs> methodology of missing maps. Thanks, Mana. Uh, so uh, the methodology of mi that missing maps use, uh, uses, and this is, like I said before, um, it's formulated by 18 other organizations, is we have three uh, different steps when, um, let's say, add it, when we want to add data or do data collection and um, mapping analysis. The first one is pre-field mapping, whereby this is uh, the remote mapping, um, as you can see in this um, first photo here, uh, whereby different people or different contributors all around the world, different OSM contributors, um, digitize or draw on the map and they draw different things. So this can be, for example, buildings or roads or rivers and other, um, other let's say, natural sources. And um, this, this data that is being um, traced here can be used by first responders, especially in areas that are faced by different disasters or crises. Uh, the second step is the field mapping, whereby uh, we want, we like to map or we want to map or we usually map with the local community members of different areas because these are the members that know their communities best. And if we want to add more information on the map, uh, we can just, um, I can just go, for example, to France and start adding uh, different data because I'm not, I'm not from there. And so we use the local communities um, to add this um, data on the map for the different projects that that are being implemented. And the final stage is the post-field mapping, whereby here it's data cleaning and analysis and map creation. Um, here you can see this, uh, this GIF is of the uh, of Dar es Salaam um, or Focus Street Map, where it shows Dar is a city in, in, in Tanzania and it has been very heavily digitized and has a lot of data in it. And so all of this data has been added by um, either volunteers or other contributors of OSM. And this data, like I said before, is usually used by the first responders um, when they're responding to different crises. Uh, thank you. I'm going to pass it over to Mana. Yeah, sure. And I will uh, share my screen now. Okay, please let me know if it's okay. Yes. Yeah. Good. Okay, so I will start with the K2NG experience on collaborative mapping on OpenStreetMap in support of an uh, urban improvement project in, in precarious uh, neighborhoods. Um, okay. So I will go very quickly on this one because I, we already presented CAR2NG, but I just wanted to present it myself very quickly. So I'm Manon View, uh, working and uh, leading the participatory mapping pool team uh, in CAR2NG and coordinating the project uh, in the frame uh, of the Missing Maps project. Uh, and I have an urban planning background <laughs> in developing countries. Uh, so before jumping in the humanitarian sector, so I think I brought a bit of my past experience in, in my uh, actual job. And I think the development in humanitarian sector are very complementary uh, on the methodology tools and uh, also in this challenge of, uh, of uh, data. Uh, so that's also why I, I, it was very uh, important for me to participate to, to this uh, conversation. Uh, so today, uh, I will present one of our uh, projects uh, led by the, the participatory mapping poll uh, in the neighborhood uh, settlement of, of Boissa in uh, Ouagadougou, uh, so in Burkina Faso. Uh, the objective of this project is to improve the living condition of local community. Uh, it is focused on two components, uh, housing improvement and urban integration improvement uh, for urban planning and urban development. Um, and CAR2NG 
as I say, is not implemented directly this project, but is a support of the implement, uh, implementing partner, uh, Young Solidarity Association. We work with them since 2019, and uh, we are still uh, supporting this project and this organization. So it's uh, still a, a work in progress. So, uh, you can see on this map, it's the, the, the purple area. Uh, is the is the product of a rapid and uncontrolled urban growth uh, of the capital of Ouagadougou. Uh, the neighborhood was built and is uh, in continuing to grow uh, out of the formal and the legal process of urbanization. So the inhabitants live in precarious condition uh, with limited access to basic services, uh, precarious housing, and no recognized uh, property uh, property titles. Uh, and of course, no urban planning and very uncontrolled uh, land consumption uh, until now. Uh, so I think it's the, 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 the key of this, uh, this presentation today, but finding data and especially uh, special data is a, is a real challenge in urban area in the global south. Uh, it's even harder in small, I think, in small and medium uh, sized town. Uh, and almost impossible in informal sp or spontaneous settlements. Uh, sooner or later, if you work on this geographical context, you will face this uh, uh, limited or impossible access to basic information. It is so frustrating and a, a very a waste of, uh, of time and make your work uh, very complicated. But uh, hopefully <laughs> there is alternative. Um, this is why, um, and it's uh, of course, uh, uh, open street map as uh, we already presented, but I will go in more detail now. Uh, so I will go back with the step that Ima presented, uh, because it's also the way we work at Carto NG as a member of the Missima project. So step one is uh, uh, is uh, the, the the remote mapping with objective is to create a, a basic map of uh, the area using Open Street Map platform and the uh, crowdsourcing. So we frontier uh, all around France, but also all around the world. <laughs> we map uh, roads, building, and even in this uh, particular project, we, we map the surrounding walls. Uh, we run uh, for this project almost, I think, eight marathons, and uh, we have a total of more of uh, 150 volunteers. Um, so the crowdsourcing and open street map make it possible to produce a map in a very short time. Of course, it's not as precise as a cadaster of our land registry. I don't really know the, the English term for that. And we do not pretend to replace, replace it. But when there is so little information, our approach at Carto NG, it's the good enough approach. So this is good enough to do the job uh, and uh, serve as a base map for the project. And set two, uh, the field data collection. Um, so we work closely with the OpenStreetMap community. Uh, they were uh, in, in Burkina Faso, they were already very involved in this project. And we also work with local community, uh, the inhabitants of Wasa. And uh, this is also what is fantastic with this new low tech technology. It is very accessible, very user friendly, and the inhabitant can be uh, involved very concretely in the project. So the field data collection is a, is a great opportunity to promote collaboration with local community and take, it, take into account their, their local knowledge. And I think it's very important for uh, urban projects. Uh, so the collective data goes directly to the OSM database, as I already explained, and uh, it's free to access, reuse, update, etc. So it's a very sustainable uh, information management uh, approach. Versus you go uh, individually in the field, collect your data, use it, uh, work it on your own computer, and then you left the project. There is no more money for this project. You left uh, the, the region, and then the, the data is, is lost. And this is what I think is very important with uh, OpenStreetMap. The, the, the data stay and can be reused for other projects, and of course, by the community uh, living there. Uh, and then next step, step uh, last step, step three, uh, making maps, at, uh, finally. <laughs> uh, and for us, it's a tool for better need assessment, 
planning and the advocacy. Uh, as I say in this project, uh, the, the, the project is still in progress. So we are not yet uh, at this stage of the project with the with Young Solidarity. But with this preliminary work, um, Young Solidarity can now use the map to call out uh, potential donors to address the, the existing issue in the area, especially in order to, to meet the basic uh, services access, for instance. Uh, Young Solidarity uh, have more elements to detail, detail this need assessment. Uh, um, and yeah, uh, other um, uh, access, the map can also be used uh, to call out uh, public authorities for recognition of uh, the existence of the neighborhood uh, and its inclusion. Uh, this is important. It's its in inclusion in the Metropolis Development Project. Um, the map is also used to raise awareness among residents to better uh, plan the urbanization of the district, protect themselves from uh, areas, area, for instance, or preserve uh, road uh, spaces, uh, public spaces, uh, ex uh, also to to ensure a certain quality of life in in, in the in the neighborhood, and um, yeah. And in the future, uh, the map will be upgraded with land use information. Uh, we are still working on a, on a methodology using crowdsourcing, open street map, uh, collaborative, participatory methodology. Uh, and this is, uh, I think, quite new. Uh, we, are very, uh, we are very focusing on, on this methodology with uh, other partners and, uh, and actors. Um, so we are interesting to, to have like a public versus private spaces. A very uh, detailed road network and uh, the uh, um, uh, area also in the neighborhood uh, in order to protect uh, land reserve and protect uh, natural resources also. Uh, so in the future, and I, I expect it near future, we'll uh, use this data for urban and development planning and uh, maybe I would have the opportunity to present the results uh, again <laughs> with you. Um, that's almost it for me. Just um, if you want to join, if you are interested in joining the, 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 the um, Discover Collaborative uh, Participatory Mapping, uh, we run Mapathons, uh, so the step one, uh, once a week remotely. And you can join and we have also volunteer mission. We are always open to, to new uh, volunteers. So we will share the link at, at the end of the presentation. Thank you very much. I have to stop sharing my screen. Yeah, um, yeah thank you, Marlon. And uh, oh, it's still presenting. Oh, yes, I've lost the... Uh, I'm sorry. Yes. Okay. I, mm. No, I'm not sharing my screen anymore. Yeah. <laughs> okay. we can sorry. You. sorry. <laughs> to you. Yeah, thank you, Madam. Um, yeah, so uh, like Nancy introduced me before. My name is Ima Kilmonja, but everyone calls me Ima, and I'm the Global Projects Associate at Human Journal Open Street Map Team, or HOT. Uh, and today I'm going to present to you a little bit about the Ramani Huria project that we have been doing here in Dar. Um, and be but before that, I'm going to introduce you a little bit to HOT. So HOT is an NGO that supports, that supports um, communities and open street map contributors and in mapping areas vulnerable to disasters and that are affected by poverty. But it goes beyond that to you know, providing different te technical tools that are usually used. For example, uh, Manon was mentioning before that they usually conduct mapathons. And the mapathons that are usually conducted by um, missing maps are usually done using the task manager, which is one of the tools that HOT has developed in you know, to kind of make it easier for contributors to contribute uh, to OpenStreetMap. Uh, right now we have, this, this, this is our mission, um, or these are our missions that HOT is working towards too, uh, whereby the first one is every, making sure that everyone is counted. And in order to do this, we have to make sure that almost everyone is 
identified and is seen on the map. Uh, the second one is making sure that map data is accessible and is used in decisions that save and improve lives. And like I was saying before, this map data um, that is usually open and, av and available in OSM is usually ac accessible by everyone, um, everyone or anyone that needs to use it for different purposes. And um, the final one is everyone can engage and contribute to the map. Uh, and when we're saying here the map, we mean open street map which, like we were saying before, is the Wikipedia of maps. Um, yeah, so HOT, like I said before, is going towards, um, it wants to, we want, we want to engage like a million mappers to make sure that they're contributing on the map. And this is an, in a duration of the next five years. If we get more, that would be great. And we are planning to reach 94 countries and also to map an area home to a billion people. And in order to achieve this, we have uh, or we have started um, to introduce different hubs, open mapping hubs and four of them. One of them is in Manila, Philippines, and the second one is in Nairobi. We're going to um, open one in West Africa and also in Latin America. Uh, and you can see here the breakdown of the countries that will be uh, that will be working with in the in this project. Uh, like we were saying before, the data that we collect is usually usually involves uh, local people or local community members. And so our model is local people, local devices, and open knowledge that is accessible to everyone. And in local people, we work with um, the community uh, in order to get the appropriate data that can be added to OSM local tools. We make sure that the tools that we're using are open and, access and accessible to everyone and they're very easy to use. And in uh, training, we make sure that we build the capacities of the community members that we usually work with so that they can continue updating the data on OSM in the areas that in the areas that they're living in. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Ramani Horia project, which is a project that has been ongoing since 2015. And it's, it's the project that, that introduced me to HOT. Um, so this project is focused on making Dar es Salaam, the largest city in Tanzania, more flood resilient. And we do this by collecting exposure data in the whole city. And this includes uh, drainage data, buildings, um, solid waste, et cetera, anything that you know, we think that can, can cause flooding in, in the city. We collect the data um, of this and we provide them to different institutions that can use this data to make the city, you know, more flood resilient. And we usually work with uh, university students or youth mappers chapters and community members in order to collect this, um, to collect this data. Um, here is an example of the of the satellite image imagery that was collect, that was taken in 2016, the core imagery, and when you can see, uh, as you can see here, the area is it has a few buildings, and so um, what I'm going to get to is how the city planners or the Ministry of Lands, for example, can use the data that we collect uh, in OSM or in the Roman Huri project to make the city a better a better place or to plan the city even better. So you can see here that in 2016, this area was very bare, but then um, last year, 2020, we collected another imagery, a maxar imagery um, to, in order to update the information in OSM. And as you can see here, the data is even, you know, it, uh, you can see the buildings are, they're, they have increased and they're not well spatially dis distributed and this uh, what we have observed is especially in the um, urban areas of the city uh, causes the inflammation of informal settlements and later leads to flooding in the city um, yeah so here is a, a, a heat map an, an example of a map that we created in a, in one word in dar that kind of shows or compares um, the world in 2016 and in 2020. And you can see in 2016, okay, there are um, some people, a few people in the Northern part of the world, but as, as days go by and like in, in just a period of four years, you can see, sorry, you can see how much um, the settlement has increased, um, all the people have increased in, in, in numbers. And this data, um, you can easily get it by using OSM because like I said before, it is, um, we, we try to keep it uh, up to date and it's not just hot, it's everyone that is contributing to the map. 
Um, and so, like I said, the Roman Huria project is based on um, community participatory mapping, whereby we work with um, different community members. We reach out to them in order to understand what their problems are. We know that the, problem, the project is focused on flooding, but when you reach to the communities, you might find that, uh, we usually find that there are other problems that uh, face the communities. And so we work with them in order to understand how we can, uh, together we can solve these problems problems uh, together with the uh, donor that is funding the project that is the World Bank and other stakeholders. And so here you can see that these are our team members and they're working with different uh, community members to um, teach them or, uh, or to introduce them in map reading in order to understand their area. Um, yeah, and so this data, like I was saying before, it can be used by the, for example, the Ministry of Lands, uh, the City Council, or UN Habitat and other areas in order to track how the city is growing and better plan the city or to conduct settlement upgrading or regularization. So as you saw uh, back in 2016, uh, there are not a lot of houses and if the if the Ministry of Lands, for example, um, does not know how the city is growing, then it can be difficult for them to provide services, for example, uh, to the people that are moving to different areas. And what we have observed right now is that people are moving are moving more to the peri-urban areas than the city center. And as they're moving to the peri-urban areas, they're, uh, they're going there with no, with no plan. So, what we're observing in the city center is exactly what is going to happen in the peri-urban areas, and that is um, the city is not going to be planned again in the near future, even for areas that are not um, built up already right now. And so this is um, some of the, these are just two examples of what we have observed generally while doing this project. And so um, since the project that, we, that we're doing is uh, focused on flood resilience, and so we collect data in order to, um, you know, for example, create a flood model so that we have an early warning system and so that people uh, can, you know, be early warned to get out of their areas in case a flood is going to hit. Um, but there has been some challenges whereby people will provide you with inaccurate data in um, because they're worried that they might be, for example, uh, relocated. And when they're relocated, they're not going to be compensated. And so these are kind of the challenges that we usually face. Um, but then again, um, one another problem or or another reason that they that they provide inaccurate data is because um, the the citizens are usually worried that the areas that they're going to be relocated to do not have adequate services or accessibility or maybe it will have like long distance travel to their work areas, and so if this is the case, one people will continue let's say living in city centers, two they will go to the peri-urban areas. But since the government is not looking at the peri-urban areas, then the people will just um, be moving there. And then, like I said before, we will have the same situation that we have in the city center right now, which is the mushrooming of informal settlements, and which will lead later to, uh, with poor infrastructure, it will again lead to uh, floods, floods in the areas that are not even flood, flooding right now. And so um, this whole project is, um, aiming to, like I said before, uh, making the city more flood resilient and to work with the with different stakeholders, with the government, with other institutions to kind of make sure that um, the areas that are not built up right now are built up in a way that is planned and that is not going to cause more flooding in the city. And we are also looking to uh, expand this project, you know, to duplicate it in other cities in Africa or in other areas of the world. And I know right now that, for example, areas like uh, Namibia, if I'm not mistaken, are kind of using the Roman Huria model that we have used in order to do the same thing in their in their in their city or in their country. So I would say that it has an impact, even though um, it's a long ongoing impact. But um, yeah, I think that is the main usefulness of open data in um, urban planning. Thank you. I'm going to pass it over to Mark.
Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Let's just get this going. Um, thanks very much for for this opportunity. Um, yeah, you're welcome to have this presentation after after the event as well. There's more information. So I'm speaking about an initiative in Southern African region, which is an online knowledge exchange of knowledge products that have to do with um, urban planning and the design of the built environment. And just some observations about this from the perspective of what does it mean to be able to access resources to support urban planning and responses, and just uh, with an example at the end. Um, so yeah, thank you for this invitation and also to acknowledge a lot of colleagues who've contributed to this initiative, um, who I won't be able to name, but um, just to give acknowledgement to that as a team effort. So we work at the interface between government, civil society, um, private sector, civil uh, sort of NGOs and academia in terms of sharing knowledge around best practice for, for urban development. And what we find and speaking maybe more for South Africa and possibly more around the state itself is information is continuously sort of almost going missing. It's hard to, to find information that was there before. Um, departments and agencies change their names and URLs change. And so we find there's this constant fluidity in the information ecosystem. Um, the other thing is that information is often hard to find. So you know that something is probably online, but it's not always well sorted. Sometimes things are available in unsearchable formats. Um, there's not always an awareness or consciousness of how important it is to add accurate and helpful metadata to documents. Um, and then even when you're browsing for information, it's often quite hard to, to, to have a sort of intuitive and logical taxonomies of information that make it easy for users to find information. And then the third sort of area of challenge is the different um, repositories of knowledge are often not maintained. They, they come and go. I think we've been working on this project since 2015 and many of the um, urban knowledge information repositories that were around in 2015, 2016 have already disappeared. Um, so there's a real challenge in this in this area around what is what are sustainable business models for keeping open access to information. So those are the kind of that's the kind of contextual challenges that we fit, that we work with. This fluidity of a fragmented information ecosystem and difficulty in sustaining the availability of data and information. Now we sort of see ourselves as fitting into a broader knowledge management cycle which is fairly familiar to everybody where knowledge around best practice and um, information and wisdom around urban development is created and captured. We tend with the Urban Knowledge Exchange South, Southern Africa to work around those last the bottom three areas, refining the information, curating the information, storing it, making it easy to retrieve on an open access date uh, basis, and then promoting networking and exchanging of data and information. Um, and then that goes back in, that good practice goes back into the application. Um, and as we know, there's many actors in the, in the urban development system and, and they all have different agendas. And we try to make an open access repository open to all those actors with different opinions, different positions um, and different types of information that they hope will benefit others. So on the Urban Knowledge Exchange, which went live in 2019 or late 2018, our objective is to provide this open access platform. Um, I should have mentioned that we work in a science council in South Africa, Council for Scientific and Industrial Research, but this initiative is held on behalf of a lot of different state agencies, um, as I've said, university, civil society organizations and private sector interests as well. So we, we try to hold this as an open repository of information um, for many of these different players. 
and then with the ultimate goal of improving planning and, and urban development, human settlements and service delivery, um, and certainly a strong role in facilitating the sharing and shared learning so that the different sectors can benefit. And so we would tend to, like the last speakers have been talking about, we would tend to measure our impact in examples and feedback of people that have found information that they found useful or disseminated information that they need to be shared. And that's had an impact in practice. But obviously that impact assessment is a longer term measurement. Um, so we're fairly, fairly young. If you look at the whole set of different types of repositories that are around, we're only two or three years old in terms of actually being live. And this is comparing our traffic um, a year ago with, the, with last year, um, ending in March 2021. Um, but what we have done is in that time, as we slowly build the library of, of knowledge products, we've managed to increase the traffic on the site um, by more than twice. And from previous experience of, of similar types of knowledge hub, you sometimes hit a, an exponential growth phase, which we starting to hit, but we still at the beginning of that growth phase. And I would say this area of knowledge rep repositories is increasingly competitive um, with a lot of different players um, uh, grabbing people's attention. And then obviously the secret is to try and work with those. So a lot of the talking about sort of access to resources for urban planning, these are just some local examples. Um, we have something in South Africa that, that CSR also developed with a human settlements department called the Red Book. Um, that's one of the um, resources. It's a guideline on, on actual settlement design. It's one of the resources that's most accessed on our site. And then two or three months ago, an NGO in the country, Built Environment Support Group, lodged a similar type of planning guide, which they had adapted for climate change challenges. Um, and that's also receiving a lot of attention. There's also in, on our site, a section of the site that um, pulls together all of the different um, repositories. And so one of the repositories is what we call the Green Book, which is really very localized um, climate risk and vulnerability profiles for cities and towns across um, South Africa at this stage. And that was with also with Canadian funding. Um, so what we do is we, we the knowledge, Urban Knowledge Exchange or OKESA um, tries to play in that space of drawing attention to people's resources. Um, and then just to finish off, just an example from last year um, of how important these knowledge repositories can be, especially in a time of crisis. Um, in, in March, just before the first South African lockdown in response to the spread of the pandemic, um, the Human Settlements Department asked us to become involved in convening a, a countrywide platform for discussion in, to respond to the emergency, especially in informal settlements and also densely populated inner city areas as well. And so they ran a WhatsApp group, the group of over 100 um, members, and we ran the Google Groups, which is a which is a closed form, but it then had public releases of information as things um, happened. And this was a week by week um, emergency response with with NGOs on the ground, with presence in informal settlements, um, needing to put water and sanitation into the right places, needing to respond to the needs for food security, um, and many of the different responses came through this, um, this interaction, online interaction. And then what we did on the Knowledge Hub at the same time, as people were sharing information about how to respond to COVID, we then, a colleague of mine led this, Nosizo Sabake, um, we started to collect together all sorts of resources that people use, and that's, that's had a lot of traffic with people trying to access information about, about um, how to respond to COVID, all the way from field hospitals to water and sanitation responses to the future of work um, and, and what that means for cities and, and city planning. And then what happened is um, a lot of the NGOs in our task group that I talked about just now, 
were then trying to shape their emergency responses. So at the same time, colleagues of ours were developing this vulnerability dashboard, which is open access, and it's a GIS system that takes a number of indicators that um, indicate the, the likelihood of spread of, of COVID and combined water, sanitation, overcrowding, informality, um, access to health facilities into a matri into a into an algorithm that was then mapped onto GIS. And then th we had to fight to keep this open access, this information with the various players in, in the state um, and managed to keep it as open information so that different organizations could be responding on time. And you can zoom in onto into different settlements and see where the greatest areas of vulnerability are. So in Cape Town, um, you can see the areas of most uh, uh, density of population, informality, and lack of access to water and sanitation. Um, and then what, uh, just as an example, UNICEF was using this information to shape their uh, water and sanitation responses and to target, apart from the coordination across the task team of who was doing what, but they were using this vulnerability set of indicators to shape their response. So I think that's just an example of what, how important it is to have access to knowledge at the right time and to build this, um, this link between data and building up into wisdom about how to respond and where can you get advice and information. Um, there's many different types of repositories and we document um, quite a few of them, but it's, it's really useful to be able to, to build this information so that, that um, people can use it when they need it. Thank you, that's, that's it from me. All right, I just um, thank you all um, very much for your presentations. For the panelists, um, please do put on your um, videos. Um, so the way we're gonna run the questions is the following. We've got one question from Facebook um, Live, which I will ask the panelists. Um, and then for those of you who would like to ask our panelists questions that are here on Zoom, please raise your hand. We can facilitate that and make it work where you can actually ask the question directly. Or if you're feeling a bit shy, you can type the question um, into the feed. Um, and then for those of you on Facebook, please just type the question into the feed. We're monitoring that as well. Um, so. To start off with, we did have a question from Freddie from Indonesia on the um, Facebook page, and he was asking about um, data and validity uh, and kind of how you're able to cross check the data that you get. And I know, Ema, you had put something in the chat, but I thought maybe um, you and Manon might like to talk a little bit about figuring out how you are able to kind of manage validity in your data. Uh, thank you, Nancy. I'll, I'll kind of expand on what I have said in the in the chat. So the data that we're talking about here is com comes in from different areas, right? Um, there is data that comes in in OSM that is usually from remote mapping mapping, and there is data from field data collection. So for the data that comes in OSM, we after people have digitized, um, we usually have validators that run through run through the data in order to make sure that the data that goes to OSM is of um, great quality and follows like, for example, like the different tags that are assigned to the data. Um, and that, for example, there is no dupli duplicate data in the area. And the other part is the field data collection, whereby, as I said, that before going to the field or before, before collecting data, we usually have, uh, create a data model that guides us in the data collection. And so after collecting the data, we have um, data quality assurance officers uh, or volunteers that clean that data um, following the data model that was, that was provided, following what the project's objectives are. Um, and in, at the end, we have the most clean data that can be provided to donors or different stakeholders that want to use um, that want to use that data. Nana? Yeah, well, we, we shared the, the really the same methodology uh, 
uh, as odd. So it's almost the same. I would just add that um, we 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 are uh, conscious that the data is, as I say, just good enough, and we are uh, aware that the 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 accuracy and the granularity of the data is maybe not as precise as. Uh, a professional doing uh, um, with uh, with all the tools and just photo interpretation uh, on the field, etc. So you have also to be aware of that. This is a, a way to fill this gap of data. OpenStreetMap is a way to fill this gap of data, but take it as it is, not that accurate, that not almost with always the, the granularity that you need for 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 your research. Thank you guys very much. I've got my screen too big and my mute button keeps um, disappearing. So we've got one question that will be live in just a second. Um, and then we've got two questions that have been asked in the question and answer feed. Um, the first is from Tony and he's asking, I know that you guys talked about um, needing to kind of use um, techniques and technologies that were available but um, and affordable, but he's also asking um, if you're able to use things like drones or machine learning um, or collaborate with places like Google or Apple or insurance companies, are you able to actually also um, utilize those kinds of techniques? I, I will let uh, Ima answer that because uh, Cartoon is a small organization, so we are very interesting and follow this new technology, uh, but we are not implementing that. But Ots, yes. <laughs> so Ima, go. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you, Manon. I'm going to touch a little bit on that. So, for example, we are now working towards working with um, AI and machine learning. And part of that, we have been doing a project with Facebook. Um, since 2017, 2018, if I'm not mistaken, that is focused on uh, AI and machine learning and adding um, different roads input to different uh, country areas uh, in OSM. And so, yeah, we work with uh, uh, different corporate partners and these are usually managed by the uh, partnerships teams and it, you know it depends on the values that the corporate if we share the same values as the um, corporate partners then we can work with them um, in, the, in the implementation of different projects so yeah um, what I can say is that right now HOT is going into the world of using AI and machine learning and we're expanding towards that. And yeah, the first step I think was working with Facebook, but we're also um, looking into working in different projects on that end. Oh, Nancy, you're muted. <laughs> yes, I am, sorry. I'm trying to be polite and then I keep muting myself. Um, we also have a question from Melissa, who is asking a lot, of, um, is asking about how you deal with kind of fragmented and competitive information um, and how you're able to manage that within your projects. Um, she's uh, talking specifically about how a lot of the knowledge platforms depend on having authority and legitimacy so people trust the use of them. Um, especially because in many cases they depend on contributions from the public and a, and a wide number of users. So really the question is around how you deal with that issue of fragmented, fragmented and competitive information. And if Melissa wants to clarify anything on that as well, um, you are more than welcome to raise your hand and I, uh, we can unmute you as well. I wonder if I could respond quickly on that. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I think uh, on, on the Urban Knowledge Exchange, that's really at the core of what we're trying to do is exactly this fragmentation that, that we can see amongst all the different players and the competition. So we, we've, yeah, building that trust, I think is a very good point. It takes, takes time for, for trust to be built and for people to feel that you're going to be a, both a, tr treat the information in a trustworthy manner. So we use quite a lot of open licensing and, and editorial decisions that are open and transparent 
and an editorial policy that's clear and privacy policies so that people trust it. But then after that, it's people's experiences. Um, to what degree do you honor those um, commitments to deal well with their information? Um, and then I think in terms of competition, that's probably exactly where we play. So one of the early comments that we had from the NGO sector is, you know, if government puts on uh, best practice on upgrading informal settlements or uh, rejuvenating inner city areas, and we as NGOs don't agree that it's best practice, then, then what happens? And what we did is set up a, um, a chat facility where you can respond with comments to people's um, documents. And obviously then there's a lot of online discussions as well. So that different agencies can challenge each other's concept of what is good knowledge and what is good practice. Um, so what we try and do is just give the platform. Um, and we also, I think something that um, Manor also mentioned is we work with information as well, which is not always perfect. And we don't have the same standards as academic journals. We try to open space for blogs and discussions as long as they're evidence-based. And, and we, we work on a sort of principle of um, share as much as you can. And then if somebody else challenges, we'll consider that. And, and then at least there's a fair exchange from people with different platforms and different power in the system. I think that's just a broad comment. Brilliant. And we also have a question from Erica, Erica Pani. So um, Fanny, can you unmute Erica or if you I've can- I've unmuted me. Oh, grand. Um, so this is to uh, any and all of the panelists, really. Um, I know uh, the, a common thread that seems to run through the projects is that uh, you really would like to inform both policy and practice uh, in your areas uh, of research uh, and knowledge exchange. I wondered if you could each give an example or some examples of where the mapping projects, um, the findings have been actually taken up in order to influence a practical response. For example, in Dar es Salaam to flood risk mass uh, um, management or um, the uh, rejuvenation of uh, city centres. Um, and there's a second little part to this, which I apologise for, but um, what what importance then as well does the community participation in these responses um, have, not just on, in the mapping side, but actually the, uh, the management of, of these issues? Thank you. Should we start maybe with um, Ramani Huria uh, project, just because I'm most familiar with that one, but then please move on to the other two as well, because they're brilliant. Thanks. Yeah, uh, thank you, Erica. That's a great question. Uh, so, yeah, I can give an example, uh, one example of how our data has been collected. So, when I was presenting earlier, I explained how uh, all the different data that we usually that we collect or we have collected in Roman Korea. One of them is drainage data, and in this, so while looking at different causes of flooding. Um, when Roman Korea was beginning, we didn't think of collecting drainage data, but while working with community members, um, they themselves were the ones that informed us, even though we knew, but they themselves informed us that one problem that usually affects them or causes flooding in their, in their settlements is uh, poor management of drainage or drainage channels or lack of drainage channels. And so um, to expand on that, we decided in the project to also collect uh, drainage data. And we did this in, okay, so Dar has like 95 wards, um, 49 of those are the ones that are usually affected by floods. And so we collected uh, drainage data from all of these 49 wards. And yes, we had, we had them ourselves, but then later uh, there was the, uh, an organization called DMDP, that's the Dar es Metropolitan Development Project. Uh, it, well, it's a project also under, under the World Bank that reached out to us and were, they were looking at expanding the, they were looking at expanding the roads and at um, managing of the flood in, in the city. And they came to us and they were asking for the drainage data because this wasn't, a, this wasn't available in the, um, 
in the agency that deals with transport here in, in Dar or in Tanzania. So they came to us to ask for that data because it, it was going to be useful and it was useful to, for them in the planning of, um, of the roads and the expanding of the roads. Um, so yeah, that's one example. And your second question was around how we work with community. Sorry, can you repeat the second part of the question? Yeah, so I'm always interested in um, how in, especially in developing contexts uh, where there is quite a lot of uh, informality and poverty, is uh, the community participation in the answers and responses to these issues. Um, because often that helps to uh, both build local capacity in terms of skills, etc. But also sometimes they might get some small payments um, that also help to boost sort of economic activity. So my interest is also in, in that direction. Okay, yeah, so in the Roman career, for example, like I was saying earlier, we usually work with the community members to um, implement these projects. And this is not just us, it's not just hot going to the communities and, you know, telling them, yeah, we need this data, so collect, it with, uh, collect this data with us. Um, we usually, like I was saying before, we usually work with them to understand, first of all, the problems that are affecting, that are affecting them and how we can work together to solve the problems. We work with um, local leaders in order to understand how the maps, for example, that we're creating are going to help them in the decisions that they're, that they're, that they're, that they're making. And there have been, because we have, we have worked with different um, or several co communities, there have been um, a lot of communities that have come back to us, um, let's say asking for more data or explaining to us how the data has helped them to um, reach out to people in the higher level to get, um, you know, to get things done in their, in, their, in their communities. And so, yes, when we go to work with them, uh, since we're like, let's say, walking around the field, you can just, even if you're calling them, let's say, volunteers, you can just leave them like that. We usually provide a little stipend uh, for, for the data collection that they're helping us with. And that usually works as a motivation in them providing you with the correct data that you, that you, that you need. Um, so yeah, that's how we usually engage with them. And if, I'm so sorry, I just need to pop in here. Um, I've been informed by um, Fanny that the project, uh, that the Zoom call will end at um, actually 12 o'clock dead on. So rather than us all just disappear abruptly, um, I thought I'd best say thank you very much to the panelists. Thank you to all of the people that have attended. Um, we will be trying to run a new event, I think, in June on homelessness. So stay tuned for that. And um, before Zoom cuts me off completely, again, thank you so much to the brilliant panelists we've had. All the pro um, presentations and links will be available. Um, and thank you guys very much for attending. <laughs>